The human quest to define what we know and how we know it begins at the beginning with the classical Greek philosophers. In The Republic, Plato examined the very pragmatic issue of how it is that people could lead good lives. And it is this seemingly straightforward question that led him to explore the very headwaters of knowledge. To emphasize that what we know must not be acquired by mere accident, Plato gave an analogy in which he compares knowledge to the work of a highly skilled artist. Daedalus was a sculptor who could make semi-magical um, statues. When you approach them, they would run away. And what Plato asks is this, why do we so highly prize knowledge? What is it about knowledge that is so desirable? Um, it's much more desirable than just mere true opinion or true belief. Um, now why is that? And out comes the analogy. The analogy is knowledge is tethered true belief. We want the statues not to run away. We want our true beliefs not to want to run away. We want them to be founded upon something permanent. The Republic also contains Plato's famous allegory of the line. He asserted that knowledge can be understood as a vertical line divided in two unequal segments, each of which is itself made up of two unequal parts. The lower portion of the vertical line represents knowledge received through the senses, that is, opinions or beliefs. The realm of the senses is further divided into perceptions of visible objects in this world on the one hand, and images and reflections of those objects on the other. As mere copies of what exists, images and perceptions are the lowest forms of knowledge. The upper portion of the vertical line represents the intelligible world, the world of what Plato called the ideas or forms the true essence of reality. This world can't be reached by the senses. It is only accessible to reason. Here, there is another division between provisional or incomplete knowledge on the one hand and the complete knowledge of the forms on the other. Episteme, true knowledge, only comes at this highest level where what is true and what is real become one. Much of what we now deal with under the concept of truth versus falsehood, Plato will deal with under the rubric of authentic versus fake. And that, that is a serious difference in a way in, in both metaphysics and philosophy of language and epistemology. In his allegory of the cave, Plato gave one of the most compelling accounts of the relationship between truth and authenticity. Plato said, Imagine a cave in which people are tied down so that they can't see behind them. They can only look ahead at the back wall of the cave. Behind them are others standing behind a ledge. These people hold puppets over the ledge. Behind the puppeteers, there is a fire whose light is projected onto the back wall of the cave. The prisoners see the shadows of the puppets, but since that's all they know, they think these shadows are reality, the essence of the world. In fact, not only are the shadows not real, but the puppets themselves are not real. Our own account signifies that the soul of every man does possess the power of learning the truth and the organ to see it with, and that just as one might have to turn the whole body round in order that the eye should see light instead of darkness, so the entire soul must be turned away from this changing world until its eye can bear to contemplate reality and that supreme splendor which we have called the good.
Aristotle was Plato's main student and often his most penetrating critic. He came to reject Plato's forms, which he felt were nothing more than abstractions of actual things. For Aristotle, individual and particular entities are the only concrete reality, and true knowledge is gained through intuition and experience. We know the idea of a triangle by abstracting common characteristics from the triangles we have seen in our daily lives. Aristotle claimed that what ultimately is real is not ideas or forms, but rather individuals. Aristotle believes that uh, uh, human beings are generally endowed with the abilities uh, to understand the world around them more or less completely. Some, of course, are better at it than others, but where Plato would see people as divided in different classes according to their abilities, Aristotle uh, thinks it's only a matter of degree rather than a matter almost of the kind of person. Actual knowledge is identical with its object. In the individual, potential knowledge is in time prior to actual knowledge, but in the universe as a whole it is not prior even in time. One attribute that the epistemologies of Aristotle and Plato have in common is that they both seek out the bedrock upon which knowledge can be built. In their view, our reasons for believing something to be true rest on a structure of basic beliefs, known as foundational propositions, which do not derive their justification from other propositions. This view is called foundationalism. The main challenge to foundationalism, first articulated by the Greek philosopher Pyro of Elis, is how do you know when you've struck bedrock? At what point does the chain of reasons stop? Which reasons are true in and of themselves? Pronians thought, okay, we get back to this foundational proposition. And then I ask you, why do you think that one's true? And you say, well, I don't have any reason for that one. Uh, and in fact, you go even further and you say, I don't need a reason for that one. Don't you see? This is foundational. And then the interlocutor can say, OK, I see. You think this proposition is true, but you don't need a reason for it. Is there something about this proposition which is such that propositions of that sort are true even though you don't have a reason for them, that you're entitled to assert them even though you don't have a reason. And you'll probably say, well, yes, they're describing my sense experience, you might say. Or you might say, um, yes, they're describing um, mental states to which I have access, like pain. And what the Peronian will do uh, is to say, well, do you think that you have infallible access to your mental states or to your sensations. And either you can say yes or you can say no. If you say yes, then the chain of reason stops. But this stopping point is itself arbitrary and can't support any subsequent links. If you say no, then your chain of reasons is infinitely long in which case you have an infinite regress and your belief isn't justified by a foundational proposition. If the chain goes in a loop, then you have a circular argument. Any way you go, you hit a brick wall. You are stuck in epistemic regress and the view that this stuckness is unavoidable is called skepticism. The most fundamental problem about knowledge we can raise is, where does the buck stop? Or does it just keep going? Skeptics saw that opposing arguments often seemed to carry equal weight and believed that the search for truth was an unending process. While this may seem a distressing conclusion, their goal was actually to achieve tranquility of mind by suspending judgment altogether. 
They rejected dogma in all its forms, and skeptics since the time of Pyro have believed that all philosophical systems are suspect because they far exceeded the limits of what can be known. The main basic principle of the skeptic system is that of opposing to every proposition an equal proposition. For we believe that as a consequence of this, we end by ceasing to dogmatize. Despite the power of their arguments, the skeptics fail to wipe out foundationalism, and it continues to be the most commonly held epistemological view. <laughs>